and welcome to the Witch's Cauldron. Uh, my name's Paula and uh, today is another in my series um, for Wicca 101. Um, this video is on altar, your altar and magical tools. And I'm not going to be able to talk about every single magical tool that you have at your disposal that you may personally bond with um, because there are tools that I bond with and then there are tools that I don't really have that kind of deep relationship with okay and um, uh, please pardon my uh, watery eyes it's a really bad allergy day for uh, leaf mold for me so please, please pardon my uh, watery eyes and, and everything. You may see me dabbing away my uh, <laughs> overactive uh, tear ducts right now. Um, anyway, let's get on with this. Um, a witch's altar is a daily reminder of your connection with the divine, with the elements, with the universe, okay? Um, you know, our belief system as Wiccans, you know, we are a part of the divine, the divine is part of us, we are all interconnected with everything in creation, um, everything has an, an energy to it, you know, even inanimate objects like rocks and um, trees and things like that in addition to you know our bond with nature in general so our altar or altars because um, I actually have more than one in my house are a direct connection with the divine and the relationship that we have with everything around us okay and some altars may have a very um, particular intent. Um, I've got an altar that is dedicated to um, pets that have passed on that have been, you know, such a dear and deep part of my life. Um, I'm a big, you know, animal person. Uh, every animal I have ever had in my life has been a rescue or uh, from a shelter so um, I've never other than paying adoption fees for those rescues and helping those rescues out I have never purchased an animal and um, I've had um, dogs um, that have been really like a reflection of my soul that um, were my familiars and I have you know an altar that is dedicated to my pets that have passed on. I also have altars or little um, I, I'm gonna say little areas because they're not exact they don't have like a dedicated table to them uh, but to my ancestors and my immediate family that have passed on my mother my father uh, my oldest sister, in addition to aunts, uncles, and uh, grandparents that have passed on. Um, so your altar and your ritual items are an integral part of not only your spell work and ritual work, but also your spiritual work. Uh, in other words, your religious practice. Um, you've probably heard me say that, you know, our rituals for our Sabbats are the equivalent of going to church, synagogue, or uh, mosque for High Holy Days, okay? Like, um, you know, Christmas, Easter for Christians, uh, like uh, Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah for Jews, things like that. Um, Ramadan for Muslims, okay? So think of that and think of that ritual that you're doing at your altar is a direct reflection of your spiritual connection 
to the divine and everything around you. I have often said that our spell work, uh, in other words, um, you know, things that we want to manifest in our uh, mundane lives, but we use a man magical way to do it. Uh, our spells are like prayers with props, okay? And that sounds kind of, you know, disrespectful, but that's exactly what it is because you're very, um, you're, you're very particular about what you include in your spell with what correspondences you use to bring about and manifest the change that you want to see. So just think of things that way. Okay. And your altar and your tools are only limited by your imagination, your creativity, and your bond with something. Okay. Now, I'm going to go through, you know, everything that I use in my spiritual practice, in my spell work, my rituals, everything is cleansed and consecrated for that purpose. Um, I even have specific, um, like spoons and things like that that I have wood burned uh, into them, sigils or intent that I use in kitchen witchery. Um, I have a very specific set of, you know, a specific cast iron Dutch oven for magical workings and things like that. So, but they've all been consecrated for a specific reason um, and it's all part of my spiritual path and my religious practice um, and I don't use those items for anything else other than my spell work and my religious practice okay because they're they're special um, so it takes time to really think about what you want to use an item for, okay? And the consecration ritual that I use um, takes time. It's not, you know, a one, two, three kind of thing. Um, the items and the way that you cleanse things depends on what type of item that it is. For me, the easiest thing for me is to use a combination of sage and lavender um, and especially for stones because salt can kind of uh, mess up stones if you leave it in there very long. Um, but I found that putting my ritual items in with, you know, like a shoe box or, you know, a, a bag or something like that with a mixture of sage and lavender and leaving it there with those herbs for a little while is a, and sometimes I throw in rosemary. That's another great one for cleansing and consecrating. Um, so I use that to cleanse it before I go to consecrate it. And, you know, my ritual to consecrate something includes a cauldron with a charcoal discs in it that are lit, and then I make up my own incense. And this would represent the element of air, okay? And the incense is frankincense, myrrh, and lavender that I use, uh, number one, because I love the smell of the resins of frankincense and myrrh when they burn as well as I do lavender. But those are all great items for clearing and cleansing negative energy from anything, especially if you're using, you know, like antiques or antique jewelry, something like that, that you really want to clear any negative energy that may be attached to an item that's already been used by someone in the past. Um, 
So I also have a red candle that represents fire. I have a small bowl with either full moon water or distilled water. Usually I have full moon water and you make full moon water by just leaving a big container, like a glass container. You never want to use plastic when you're doing this stuff. You want to use things that are made from a natural uh, material. So you can use, you know, a metal container or glass, something like that. And then you take the water. I usually use distilled water or purified water. Um, and you put it out the three nights of the full moon. That's the night before, the night of the full moon, and the night after the full moon. And that's how you make full moon water for cleansing and consecration. Um, I also have a little container of sea salt, and then I have the items to be cleansed. And the process that I use is to take the item and run it through the smoke of the incense and say, inspired with air and then pass the item over the flame of the candle which represents fire but do it high enough so it's not going to catch fire okay and then say emboldened by fire and that's emboldened me and my southern accent then I take and put take my finger dip it in the bowl of water sprinkle the item with a little bit of water saying cleansed with water and then sprinkle the item with salt or touch it to the container of salt that I have and say strengthened by earth and then I hold the item up to the divine okay the the gold and silver candles that I have on my that are altar that are lit to represent the God the goddess and say infused by spirit and then as I do that I imagine divine bright blue cleansing light cleansing and consecrating that item for me okay then I hold the item with my projective hand in other words my dominant hand and then I say by if it's a rock or a stone I say earth made or if it's an item that I've made or someone else has made I say by man-made and by magic changed okay and then I say this whatever it is shall serve me in this world between the worlds and in all the worlds because our magic you know goes through the different planes okay and then I say I infuse this whatever it is with the intent of whatever in the name of the goddess and the god i hereby consecrate this whatever it is and then i say so mode it be and then i place that item on my altar and i proceed to the next item almost every piece of jewelry that i own has been consecrated and infused with intent the only uh, things that have not been are items that of like costume jewelry that aren't of natural made materials uh, but just about everything else that I own has been consecrated with a specific intent okay um, so the magical tools and this is not um, you know, an all-inclusive list. Okay, the first items that I want to speak about are besoms or um, brooms. And I have an example of the two besoms that I use. This one is a smaller, short-handled one. Um, that is used, you know, ritualistically. Um, it's not meant to, you know, physically sweep out anything out of my house. Um, you know, this is my symbolic small besom, okay? Now, the other one that I have, and it's more like a traditional besom. You'll see it's got the sticks for the bottom and then the handle 
but on the handle um, is the Wiccan Reed and it harm none, do as ye will, um, written in Theban, which is the witch's alphabet. Okay, and um, this is one of my most prized possessions. A, a very dear person to me made this for me. Um, this is handcrafted with a lot of love. Um, the handle on this one is made out of bamboo um, so it's not one of the traditional sacred woods that is used, um, you know, like ash um, or hawthorn or rowan um, for the handles of the brooms. Um, but this is such a, a, was such a beautiful gesture that it means a lot to me that someone made it for me. And this one, of course, I use to like literally ritualistically sweep the crap out of my house okay um but those items are limited to ritualistic use okay um now in the middle ages some of the things you know about witches flying on their brooms comes from the fact that um witches made um an ointment that they would call flying ointment. And in it, it had psychoactive drugs like belladonna, which is nightshade, um, and mandragora, um, which is, I believe, a type of mandrake. Um, and uh, they're psychoactive drugs. They're also kind of on the toxic side, but they would um, rub this ointment on themselves, especially like the, the head, temples, and stuff like that, forehead, wrists, hands, feet, under the arms, and between their legs, and that would give them the sensation of flying, and they would run through the fields um, with a stick between their legs or a broom between their legs, and um, that they symbolically would teach the crops how high to grow. That was the purpose of that action, okay? Um, so, and sometimes um, there are uh, like drawings from the 15th century that show male witches that were, you know, pejoratively called warlocks. Um, most male um, magical practitioners that I know call themselves witches, not war warlocks, because uh, to them warlock has a more negative connotation. Um, so the, the like drawings would show the male witches riding around on pitchforks instead of a broom, okay? Um, now, Also, brooms figure into um, hand fasting ceremonies for modern Wiccans, and even this has been um, more embraced now um, as jumping the broom in part of like a marriage or commitment ceremony. And it has been uh, revived um, for the African-American community um, that it's now rising to popularity again. Um, so, you know, now, if you take a besom and you point it bristles up above a doorway, um, that helps protect a house from evil spirits or negative energies, okay? Now, you can also place one under your bed to protect you while you sleep. And there is an old conjure uh, tradition that if you put your, if you have an unwanted guest, put your be some by the front door and 
stick a, st a straight pin in it, your unwanted guest will leave PDQ, okay? So, you know, those are some of the traditions uh, with the besom um, or the broom and some of the, you know, historical connotations behind it. Um, the next one is your altar. And um, it's usually like a table um, or a chest of some kind. Um, it can be a stone outside that you've constructed. Um, it can be a tree stump. It can be just just about anything in your imagination. The only thing that I say is that it needs to be of a natural material. In other words, you don't want to really use something that's plastic um, and man-made for your altar. Um, my altar happens to be a an oblong wicker um, table that was primarily for you know like a porch or a veranda and this was a wedding present part of a set the chairs fell apart and were long gone um, but the table survived and this was part of a set that was presented to my grandparents when they got married um, so it has a very very special familial meaning to me um but you know my other altars um are areas where i have cleared off space um like on a wooden table or a a glass end table or you know something like that where i have like an ancestor's altar one for my familiars and my my pets that have passed um and then i have an area on one of my uh, dressers upstairs that's like my daily kind of meditational altar. Um, so it's whatever speaks to you and whatever you bond with, okay? Because there are no rules. Um, the only thing that I really recommend is that on my table, I have the large uh, glass round glass to protect my table from candle drips, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, your altar holds your tools like your wand, your cauldron, elemental representations, representations of the divine and everything like that. And I will insert a picture of my altar for Samhain this year. This is my main altar and I have it set up for Samhain already, which is, you know, Halloween. So I'll insert a picture of that right here. And in the background, you can see my besom in the corner, you know, pointed up next to it. I try and keep all of my magical workings, um, you know, in one area of my living room. Um, and it's a very sacred place. No one is allowed to touch it other than me. My better half doesn't even mess with stuff that is on my altar. Um, he doesn't touch it um, because it's very disrespectful for anyone to just go up and grab stuff and pick it up off of a witch's altar. That will uh, cause you to draw back a bloody nub. Uh, with me um, because it's, it is extremely disrespectful um, unless you have permission from the witch to touch their items okay the next thing I want to talk about is the wand and the wand is a thin straight stick and they're usually made of wood um, really really old ones were made of ivory um, now I have three wands that I use routinely. The first one is made from willow. You'll see it's very basic, very me, 
Um, and I made this one. The other one that I have, and most people do not have um, wands made of this wood, but this wood means something to me because this wood is so common where I am from. And this one is made of black walnut. Um, where I come from in West Virginia, black walnut was all over my grandmother's farm. Um, and uh, I actually brought the black walnut uh, branch that this is made from back from somewhere near my aunts and uncles home um, the last time that I went out and actually picked up a whole bunch of black walnuts to hull and shell. Um, that was many years ago. Um, and then, what did I do with it? Oh, there it is. I have one when I do healing sessions. And this is my Reiki wand. And on it, it's got crystals that correspond to the seven different chakras. It's got a crystal point here at the top. Um, it's got, you know, additional symbols here. It's got a crystal point here at the bottom. Um, the middle is um, a glass rod that uh, was cut. Someone made this for me. Um, and um, it is so beautiful and so unique. It's got the Om symbol up here in Sanskrit. Um, so this is another item that is very, very near and dear to me. And I use it all, every time I do a healing or I conduct a Reiki session. Okay. And again, your wand is something that you want that you have a deep personal relationship with. It's kind of like, you know, in Harry Potter, when he goes into Ollivander's wand shop, he bonded with the one wand with the phoenix tail feather in it, right? And the other ones did all kinds of wacky stuff for him. So it's whatever you bond with. And especially if you make that wand yourself or someone that you care about makes a wand for you that put a lot of love and effort and thought into making something for you or you've put a lot of effort into making something for yourself um you know with my wands i had a friend um do the the one the uh, black walnut one he turned it on his lathe for me to sculpt those ridges out that went all the way around so but the other carvings and the stripping down of the wand and stuff like that was done to me the staining of them and the sealing of them was done by me so you know a lot of work goes into your wand if you make it yourself and you can buy one that's already made especially if it calls to you and there is absolutely nothing wrong with that Okay, um, the wand is a tool of invocation. It is used to invoke the gods and goddess and spirits to channel energy. It can be used to cast your circle. Um, and you can, I mean, I typically use my athame that I'll talk about in just a second. And an athame is more strong but a wand um, is used more to invite or encourage than rather than to command, where an athame would command. Um, it, it, wands are especially effective in healing rituals, bestowing blessings, uh, drawing down the moon, charging objects, um, and wands are also um, a suit in the minor arcada of the tarot decks. 
Um, it's also, they're also called batons or rods. Um, and wands are normally associated with the element of fire. Now, the athame is a ritual knife that is double-sided. Um, now, some people say that it has to have a black handle. Neither one of mine have a black handle. Um, one of mine is this one. And um, it's got, you know, a sheath to it. On the back of the sheath, it's got like a little clip that you can use it to clip on your cord or your belt if you so desire. And you can see here, mine's fairly fancy. It's engraved on both sides of the blade, but it's fairly hefty. It is not overly sharp because I don't cut anything with this. Okay, it's not meant for cutting. Um, this is a ritual knife alone, okay? This is what I use to cast my circle, um, to cut doors between the worlds, um, things like that. Okay, now, I'll show you my other one. And this one is here, and it has a Celtic kind of looking thing. And when I first did my God and Goddess uh, meditation, when I was going through my training as a witch, this is exactly how the God and Goddess appeared to me in that meditation. And I will um, put a card in right here um, if you want to go out to the God and Goddess meditation. Um, and I f just so happened to find this um, on eBay. I think it was from um, Friends Co. Wiccan Company, I think is what it was called. I don't think they're in business anymore. Um, but it was a, a company out in, I believe, Indiana. Um, and I got a lot of my supplies from them when I first started out. It's also got, you know, the double-sided blade, but it's engraved with beautiful Celtic knotwork on it, okay? So I would never use these to cut, you know, physically cut anything. Um, but I do use them, you know, whichever one is calling to me at the time. Um, I use in my ritual, okay? And uh, this one came also with, you know, like a, a sheath for it so that it, I don't damage the blades when I'm not using it. Now, there is also another ritualistic knife that you actually cut with, and it's called a bolin. And this is mine. They, bolins usually have a white handle on them. Some bolins, it depends on your tradition, some of them are straight. You can see mine, I get it out, has a curved blade on it like a scythe, okay? And you can see in here, it's got a serrated blade on one side and then a sharp blade on the other. It's got a very sharp blade point on the end. This is what I use when I wildcraft and go out searching for herbs and things to harvest in the woods. Like if I want to harvest some honeysuckle that's growing behind my house, or if I want to harvest some mulein that is growing on the side of the road. Um, if I want to harvest willow um, from our big willow tree um, at our other house uh, to use to make uh, reeds or I typically use the willow to make uh, 
pentacles out of and decorate them for specific intent um, for ritual uh, or for altar decorations. I've even made them as gifts, um, you know, and put them inside of like um, make a pine wreath and then put the willow pentacle in the middle um, and then decorate a wreath for Yule for friends. Um, I usually do that every year. Um, so I use the bowl one to actually um, harvest or to cut anything. Um, now, it can be associated in the tarot um, with the um suit of swords now the next thing that i want to talk about is my cauldron this is the cauldron that is on my altar and this one is used for burning for incense for things that i want to burn say that um, part of my spell is wanting to release uh, hurt or bad habits, something like that. And you write something on a piece of paper and you want to burn it to get rid of it. Throw, you know, you've got charcoal discs down in here to, um, you know, provide the heat for it. And then, you know, um, throwing a little saltpeter in it. Um, and making it go and flame up just makes me a happy little girl as a fire leo i love saltpeter and it's neat to watch it go and blow stuff up in your cauldron it's great saltpeter's great for everything so there's this cauldron my other one i am not going to lug up here because it, I actually use it for potions, cooking, and things like that. It's a big cast iron Dutch oven. It weighs a stinking ton and a half. And I don't want to hold it up. I'm lazy. Um, so the cauldron um, are usually made out of cast iron. I also have some that are made out of copper but I don't like burning things in them or exposing them to a lot of fire because it makes the copper turn a funny color, okay? So, um, now, the cauldron is a symbol of the womb of the goddess, okay? Of death and rebirth, um, so this item is affiliated with the goddess, okay? Where, you know, an athame because of like, and a wand because of their like, you know, phallic kind of shapes are associated with the god. Um, now, in honor of this channel, the witch's ca cauldron, um, in Celtic mythology, the cauldron is associated with the goddess Caridwen. Um, and look up the mythology of Caridwen, but Caridwen's cal cauldron was the source of knowledge, okay? And there's a whole myth and story, mythology and story associated with it. Um, and Celtic legends also tell of cauldron being used by warring armies. Um, the dead soldiers would be placed into the cauldron and returned to life, but they you know, um, lacked the power of speech and possibly a soul, so they would be like golems. Um, and those soldiers would then go back into battle until they were killed again. So... Um, in Irish myth mythology, Tir Nanog, which is the Irish land of the dead, was presided over a crone 
and her cauldron to which all life returns to await rebirth okay so that's some of the background of a cauldron and how I typically use it but primarily my cauldron is used for you know burning of my incense that I incorporate into a ritual now the next one is a chalice now mine is glass many people have some that are made of pewter or um, even wood something like that I just prefer I, I mean I love this glass I, I love this chalice it just it spoke to me I had another one uh, another chalice that was uh, made of pewter for a while but this one this one I bonded with when I saw it so um, it represents the element of water it's affiliated with the goddess it also represents the womb of the goddess okay so think about some rituals um, you know, involve placing the athame or wand into the chalice, and that represents the union between the god and the goddess, okay? Uh, usually that's done at Beltane, um, or incorporated in your Beltane ritual. In ancient times, chalices could also be made out of uh, horns, animal horns, gourds, um, and shells to hold sacred liquids. Um, so the chalice is very important in your ritual in the part that is called cakes and ale. Now you don't have to have cake and you don't have to have ale. That's what it's just called. Uh, I know many Wiccans uh, who and witches who have substance issues, substance abuse issues in their past and an issue with alcohol they use juice okay I tend to I'm not a humongous fan of ale but I love mead I love my distilled spirits um, so you know sometimes I'll use pomegranate juice something like that okay especially pomegranate juice at Halloween or Samhain um, or at Samhain, I do a mulled apple cider, so cider with sp uh, spices in it, and then let it cool and put it in that chalice. Um, the next item I want to talk about is the pentacle. Now, it can be any number of things. I actually have two that I use. This is the primary one, okay? And it's a metal disc with pentacle on it, okay? The other one is set into, this is a drawing that I found and I absolutely loved it and found that the artist sold this on eBay years and years and years ago you guys have probably seen this image somewhere on google but i bought this like 12 or 13 years ago um the outside is metal and then she had the decals and stuff made of the artwork and then put it in here inside so i i have this decal hanging on or put on my front windows um, just because I love the elemental representation and everything in it and the beauty of this artwork so the pentacle um, is a magical tool and it's another means to command or certain or summon certain energies um it represents the element of earth if you want to use it for that um 
You can also just make a pinnacle out of parchment, paper. Um, you can also, it, they can be clay, stone, wood, anything. It's what you, re, resonates with you, okay? And with the, the one point upright, it's Wiccan, inverted with the one point down. That's typically associated with Satanism. Most people do. Um, now, in the tarot, the um, pentacles are affiliated with, sometimes it's coin, called coins or discs. Uh, depends on the deck that you use, um, but they're pentacles in most de um, decks now, and it's affiliated with the element of earth and uh, all of those associations. Now, incense, the one that I have routinely on my Dagon altar is a mixture of sage and lavender. Right there. There you go. And that's one of my go-to. Um, a lot of times I also have a frankincense, a small jar of frankincense and myrrh. Because um, that's another one of my favorite blends. So the use of incense uh, predates, you know, biblical times. Um, and most scholars think that the use of incense may have actually started in uh, Babylonia or Egypt, okay? It was um, imported into the area that is now called Israel in about the 5th century um, BCE. Um, and it was used in offerings. And then it later spread to Greece and Rome and uh, into India and then Japan and China. Um, now, incense is used often to represent the element of air, because think about it, the smoke, you know, air. It is, it can be burned in a sensor, which is, you know, a small little container. Uh, think about it, like in the Roman Catholic Church, where they swing the incense burner that's on a chain that's a sensor okay um it can also be just like you know an earthenware bowl that you put charcoal disc in etc so um in the handouts that are linked below giving you some basic you know um incense resins um, that are typically used in, in bases um, because your, your incense is more powerful if you combine resins with the herbs and powders that you use because resins have a longer burning time, um, you know, so they help keep that energy going and you don't have to keep, you know, throwing more herbs because the herbs and the powders um, dissipate quicker. Um, there are also um, smudge sticks made out of white sage um, that I use to cleanse my house and rid the negative energy out of the house on a routine basis, but also before ritual, I use it even over my body, okay? And I cleanse with that and then I anoint myself with an oil. Um, so you also have candles, crystals, herbs, and oils, and these are also very, very personal to you. Okay. And, um, you know, a candle that I have on my altar all the time is a red one, like in a little red thing right here. And it's actually, um, a red candle inside and that's my representation for fire on my altar so 
you can also you also have candles on your altar that are um, you have an altar candle or at least I do um, that is affiliated with the intent of the ritual or the spell that you're working you can do candle magic but your altar also has gold and silver candles on it to represent the god and the goddess okay um, in the handouts I've given you some colors and there are magical correspondences um, now I'm not going to go into you know a bunch of you know correspondences for gemstones and herbs um, and things like that and oils um, because there are books out there that are so great on these subjects and um, the one for like practical like candle burning magic is practical candle burning rituals and that book is by Raymond Buckland um, that is one of the most well used books in my collection it's actually on the shelves behind me um, another for the gems and crystals is by Scott Cunningham and it is Cunningham's Encyclopedia of Crystal Gem and Metal Magic. Um, the next two books are also by Scott Cunningham and one is his Encyclopedia of Magical Herbs and then his incense oils and brews the complete book of incense oils and brews i highly recommend all of those books um i also have um excuse me here my llewellyn's complete book of correspondences you will see my dog-eared pages and everything else in here um, when it comes to determining correspondences for specific intent, I use a combination of different books. The other one is Holland's Grimoire of Magical Correspondences. That one is out of print. If you can find one, like on thrift books, that's not too expensive, great. The last time I looked on eBay and Amazon, uh, they were going for about $200, and I almost died. Um, but that Holland's uh, Grimoire of Magical Correspondences is phenomenal, as is the Llewellyn's book, okay? Now, there you want to also include on your altar items of a personal nature. Um, it can be anything. And like with mine, let's see here, this is an elemental bottle that I did when I was in my training you can see that it is looking a little ragged and haggard and I don't care because I made this this is infused with my energy um, it has things in it that have a representation to me for each one of the elements and it's got a scroll inside that I wrote um, about the elements and what they mean to me okay so this is you know one of my little prize possessions it is ragged um, and it on it it says earth my body water my blood air my breath and fire my spirit uh, that is a Wiccan chant um, I can link that one I'll put it in the cards how's that we'll link it in the description box but I'll throw it in the cards up here. Um, another thing that I have on my altar is um, I had a familiar uh, named Sydney that was one of my dogs. And um, we had such a special bond because I rescued him from a very, very precarious uh, existence he was literally rescued out of a crack house in Richmond Virginia and um, he had been so mistreated um, when I got him he even had cigarette burns on his belly he had not been treated well at all and I did not know if I was going to be able to rehabilitate this dog or not because he didn't trust anyone 
and we developed such an unbreakable bond and I lost him to cancer several years ago. I lost three dogs to cancer within four years. Um, and they were all 12 years old when I lost them. Um, it broke, they broke my heart. But I have ashes from my first familiar, Sydney. Sydney was my watchdog um, during ritual. He was so in tune with me and spirit and my ritual work that he literally stood guard while you know I'm at my altar I was at my altar uh, he literally stood guard with me the entire time um, sometimes on um, when we do paranormal Friday nights with my other channel Bull Run Paranormal and uh, with Uber Goober Lady I'll link her channel below I'll link both those channels below. Um, you can see a, a dog tail wagging right back here because normally his altar of is right there where my finger is wiggling on that table. Uh, right now it's been relocated because of uh, Halloween decorations. Um, but um, yeah, um, so I have the ashes for my familiar. Um, on there now um, all three of my dogs that I have now are so in tune that they are my ritualistic watchdogs they all are bonded with me they are all just like familiars to me um, you know so there you have it but your altar should have something very personal to you um, and whether that's a rock Something that you made, let me see, here is something that I made, and I made it out of Sculpey clay, I was in my training, um, my tradition, its symbol was um, uh, the Triketra, the three, just the three, you know, like the Trinity knot. And uh, I inscribed that the clay is infused with um, herbs that I have um, that are affiliated with my tradition. Uh, my tradition has its own like incense blend. Um, and in the back, I pressed in a leaf of sage for healing and protection. And um, so that is usually also on my altar. And the main thing is, is that I spend time every day with my altars, whether it's, you know, it, and I have four, my meditation altar, I have my regular altar, I have my ancestor altar, and then I have my animals and pets altar. So, you know, um, it's a reminder for you to be connected with the divine. There are no limits to your altar. There are no limits to what you can do. Some people use very, very small altars, um, especially uh, people, younger people that I have known that are in college. They have like a little box that has everything. The box then serves as their altar. And then all of their items are very scaled down, like very small, many candles and stuff like that. They're not as elaborate as the setups that I have now, but they can, you know, stow their items away, tuck them away, um, because they don't really want to necessarily have everything out in a dorm situation. Um, so they can, pack everything away, slide it away, and then bring it out when they want to do spell work or ritual. So there you have it, my friends. Um, I will have the, as I said, the handouts in the description box. I plan on a live stream for this. I don't know that I'll be able to get it done this weekend. It'll probably be the weekend after. So it'll probably be after Samhain, because uh, next weekend I don't think we're going to be in town. Um, so probably after Samhain we'll have the live stream. 
and we may do a, a double issue uh, just like I did the um, last live stream. So there we have it, my friends. If you have any questions, just let me know. Be sure to like and subscribe before you leave. As I always say, Merry we did meet. Merry we will part until we merry meet again. Be well and blessed be everybody. Bye. Mm -hmm.